morning uh, for the King and Suit for Faith and Cultures honoring of Black History Month. We This is an event that came together at the last minute. We had somebody who had had to cancel on us uh, for the eighth time this year, uh, but we had the wonderful services and, and willingness of our two speakers this morning to come and pitch in. I want to thank especially Bianca Murray for helping move this event along and getting us uh, into place for it. So I'm delighted to have an event today. We are going to repeat this in an evening, but it's not going to be till February 28th. Usually we have our events on the same day, but in this case we're going to do this again in the evening on the 28th. I do want to mention briefly our two upcoming events, and then I'll introduce our, uh, our panelists here. Next Monday, we have uh, two events that are both count for CCS credits. They are our Beekner Lecture for the year. This is Matthew Milliner. Matt is an art historian, and he is somebody who writes about just about everything. He is a very engaging and brilliant mind. Matt will be here at 915 in chapel. His talk is going to be about the Cherokee and Christianity. He has a book on uh, Christianity and Native American people. In the evening, his talk is going to be more art history focused. It's going to be a history of art in one image. This is, comes from a book he wrote about the history of images of the Virgin Mary. I'm also going to have an on, on stage interview with him at 5 p.m. and the evening events are at First Presbyterian Church. The week after that, February 27th, we host our annual medical lecture. This is a guy called Austin Scholl. Austin is a cancer researcher and he's going to speak in the morning about vocational discernment and the scientific method something that he's been spending a lot of time thinking about. Uh, Austin is involved with me in a project called the Network for Vocation and Undergraduate Education, and this is part of his work with them. He's going to do science seminar that afternoon, and then in the evening at 7 o'clock at Central Presbyterian Church, Austin's going to talk about a history of cancer research, something he's worked on for a long time. So we have quite a few things upcoming. I hope you can join us for a lot of those. Um, but I'm glad you're here this morning. Thank you both for those online and those here for, for joining us today. Our two speakers this morning have both been working on uh, Black History Month related activities for a long time, and it's great to get them on the stage together to talk about it. Tina McDaniel is a mover and shaker in Bristol. I asked her to what, how to introduce her, and she said, just say, I'm retired from many things. <laughs> Uh, which is interesting. <laughs> Retired from many things to do a lot more. Uh, Tina is involved in many local boards, including the King Institute for Faith and Culture, and she has been involved uh, in all kinds of work. She currently does work in DEI initiatives for Bristol's Promise. Uh, Preston Mitchell comes to us from Wise County. He's a native of Bristol. He went to Bristol, Virginia High School and then went to the Citadel as an undergraduate. He spent many years in the Wise County school system as a teacher and as a principal, and he spent many years at UVA Wise teaching history and also coaching basketball. Um, both Preston and Tina are therefore local people who know this area well, and they're also people with a great interest in digging into the past, particularly the African-American community's past here in Bristol. So I wanna start with that question if you grew up in this area, what did you know about African-American history in this area growing up? How aware were you of that history? Well, I can speak for um, Bristol. I've been in Bristol since 1977. And the only awareness I had of um, the history of the black community was those who were within the community, such as Mr. Uh, Lorenzo Wyatt, who um, was a deacon at the church that I attended. So he was very involved uh, in the community. But as far as history, that just did not exist. And I became curious after I retired from Bristol. Um, and so that was just the beginning of my interest in the history of the quest. Well, I can predate. Tina, because uh, I came to Bristol in 1955, and for the first eight years of my education, I went to an all-white school, Thomas Jefferson Elementary, and every day, when our neighborhood carpool, we went by Douglas School, and I never gave a thought about it, and I went by Douglas School and the Morocco Motel, which had a neon lights, colored motel. So that people traveling, this is days before uh, I-81 uh, circumvented the city, knew where they could stay. When I was in the ninth grade, suddenly, and it was rather sudden, 
uh, Bristol, Virginia, as well as Tennessee High, I think, uh, desegregated the same year. Uh, I went to school with black students. And playing basketball, I thought, well, my goodness, I'm getting my time cut out because half of our team was black. All of a sudden, we were half black, half white. And so that's what I knew about uh, segregation. I went to the Citadel where uh, my roommate for three years was one of the first 12 gra black graduates of the Citadel, the military college of South Carolina that fired on the boat going to Fort Sumter, that reveled in their Confederate backgrounds with the playing of Dixie at the Friday afternoon parades and the waving of the Confederate flags at football games and the de facto segregation that occurred on that campus. And I'm part of a, a movement at, at the school to 50 years plus uh, and the progress that's been made um, over those years. So that's what I know about growing up in Bristol. So from a, uh, it seems to me that it's a history that was not well known uh, in for, for people who are here for a while. Um, what got you both interested in trying to dig into this history and trying to find more of it uh, as, you, as you have gotten involved in the more recent years? So whenever I realized that there was a gap in terms of what was documented as far as the history, um, I learned about a community history day that was happening in Elizabethton, Tennessee, and it was sponsored by Black in Appalachia. Um, so I saw it, I attended, and I thought, gosh, we need to do something like this here in Bristol. So um, I sponsored a community history day where people within the black community could come in, they could share newspaper articles, pictures, do oral histories, and all of that is documented on the Black and Appalachia website. So if you want to go out there and search under Bristol, you'll find what we um, yeah, uncovered during the Community History Day. So that's kind of what got it started for me. And then making that connection with William Isom with Black and Appalachia. So from that, we did other stories. Um, Dr. Jewel Bell, who all of you are familiar with, um, she and I met with William Isom downtown Bristol. So she told us about uh, the Black Bottom, which was the Bristol, um, it was the business district for the black community. Um, in Bristol, so Ms. Uh, Jewel Bell was able to provide us with a lot of history around that. So that's kind of what, um, I guess, got me started, um, and, it, and it continues. Well, my, uh, as, as Martin said, um, I've taught history on the high school and college level. My field is not American history. But um, how many of you all uh, saw Dr. Bill Turner, have been, heard Dr. Bill Turner speak? Well, Bill Turner and I became friends years ago because of a research project that I uh, worked on that he uncovered a narrative that I wrote about a, a black freedman colony on the border of Kentucky and Virginia on the Bluff Spur of Black Mountain. And um, I took him up there and we, we became friends and he's kind of hooked me into some, some various uh, things with, with uh, black history in the Wise County area. And uh, with that um, connection and with <clears throat> my church, uh, where <clears throat> I work um, as a deacon in the Episcopal Church and through the bishop asked me to do some, some things with, with racial reconciliation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the things that, one of the things that I, found out is that this work in Equal Justice Initiative that um, <clears throat> recognizes, recognized uh, lynchings that took place in America. Equal Justice Initiative founded by Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy, may have seen the movie, um, has a legacy museum and memorial grounds that recognizes and documents over 4,000 uh, documented lynchings in the American South of African Americans. And I thought, hmm, wonder if there's any in southwestern Virginia. Well, you know what? There are more lynchings of African Americans in southwest Virginia than any other part of the Commonwealth of Virginia. And that's kind of surprising, but it, 
That's what it is. And I found out there were three of those lynchings in Wise County. <clears throat> and so we uh, formed a community remembrance group, a coalition of uh, three African-American churches, Episcopal churches, the University of Virginia's College at Wise, the Pound Historical Society, where the last documented lynching took place, and um, the Wise County School Board. And we, we secured resolutions from all six towns and the Board of Supervisors, a long period of process. This is about a three-year process until we have had two of those uh, lynchings have markers and a third one is in manufacturing and the ceremony is uh, set for um, April the 22nd. Do you have the... You wanna do one of the videos? I thought the short video on the David Hurst may be the one that's fairly short because sadly, the David Hurst um, marker was stolen six weeks after the installation. Uh, we are still working with the Sheriff's Department. We've taken out full page ads. We have a reward. We're, we're talking about how we're going to replace that in a more secure location, but that's not the purpose. This is where the lynching actually took place. Um, I don't know. <laughs> yes, yes it is. So this is a short video that was done by Will Isom's Black in Appalachia, and he's been a great partner. If you if you go to Black in Appalachia YouTube, and you can you can watch a lot of stuff. <laughs> so originally a coalition that consisted of African American churches in Wise County, the Episcopal churches in Wise County, UVA Wise, the Pound Historical Society, and the Wise County School Board. On November the fourteenth, nineteen twenty. A large white mob lynched a 25-year-old black coal miner by the name of Dave Hurst. Authorities had arrested Mr. Hurst two days earlier after a white woman reported that she had been assaulted by a black man. During this era, the deep racial hostility that permeated Southern society burdened black people with the presumption of guilt that often served to focus suspicion on black communities after a crime was reported or discovered whether evidence supported their suspicion or not. In the early morning hours of November the 14th, a white mob broke into the Wise County, Virginia jail, kidnapped Mr. Hurst and drove him to a bridge about two miles near here, where they hanged him with a log chain. Afterwards, the mob shot the body repeatedly and then dragged Mr. Hurst's remains by car to Blackie. His clothes were torn off and his body was bruised and disfigured by the bullets. Although two white men were tried and convicted for participating in the mob, the governor of Virginia pardoned the men in 1923. None of the other dozens to hundreds of mob participants faced any legal repercussions for their roles in the lynching of Dave Hurst. This is where the sign once stood near Appalachia, Virginia. <coughs> the coalition behind the sign says its theft is shocking, but it won't stop them from building a new one. How can we keep living in the future if we don't know anything about the past? Gravelly and other members of the coalition are committed to get it replaced should the original never turn up. So with that, uh, introduction there. Can you tell us a little bit about the history you have uncovered? What is the, tell us a little bit about the lynchings. Uh, what happened? Right. There's a, a website called Racial Terror in Virginia, 1877 to 1950 by uh, Dr. John DeFazio at James Madison University. <coughs> we found that that's the, the best um, access to lynching in Virginia. And um, Dr. Tom Costa, who co-chaired with me the Community Remembrance Project, was able to get a grant and hired three student interns to further um, investigate through uh, mainly uh, uh, some um, newspaper accounts, some a court record uh, for the lynchings. And so we really actually, and those students contributed to 
Dr. DeFazio's website. But um, the three, the first one in 1902 was in a place called Bontown, which is a little coal camp a mile or two from Coburn, Virginia. And uh, Wiley Gwynn was a father, a uh, husband and father who ran a boarding house in Bontown. He was accused of assaulting a 12-year-old white girl uh, up on Tom's Creek, a ridge uh, outside of Bontown. Uh, her screams alerted some people. They literally chased uh, Wiley Gwynn and, and caught him. This is 1902, so some, somebody rode a horse up to Wise to get the Commonwealth Attorney, and while they were um, holding uh, Wiley Gwynn, before the Commonwealth Attorney got there, they were gonna take him to the Wise County Jail. Somebody convinced him that he needed to run. He broke and ran and they shot him uh, and then drug his body by the railroad track in Bontown where the body uh, stayed. We actually uh, found in an interview a woman who's passed away since, whose mother uh, told her about that uh, scene. Again, what you saw with David Hurst's body and what was with Wiley Gwynn's body, these were public spectacles. This, this was designed, they were designed to tell the community this is what happens when you cross those, those racial lines. The second, uh, the second one was, was David Hurst, who was a coal miner uh, from uh, Harlan County, Kentucky, who had come over to work in the coal camp of Dunbar, and he was accused of assaulting um, a 67-year-old white woman in the cane patch section of, uh, of that part of the county. And it was, again, it was by the railroad track, and um, she flagged down, told some people on the train, and they ended up finding Dave Hurst on up the road and uh, took him to jail. But they, they busted him out of jail uh, two days later and drug him back to the site. Again, that's a lynching. Uh, you see that with lynchings is they bring him back to the site of the alleged crime. They hung him from a railroad trestle, which is still there, uh, a logging chain, and then drug his body about a mile and a half to the main road where they left the body that you saw uh, in that picture. The third uh, and the most publicized was the last documented lynching in Wise County, and it was the first sign that we got up on the Pound Kentucky border, and that was of Leonard Woods. Leonard Woods, <clears throat> and this is too convoluted to go into, but he was. He, he shot, he did shoot and kill uh, an engineer, 27-year-old white engineer named um, Herschel Deaton, graduate of Virginia Tech. He and two friends were <clears throat> in uh, the, uh, the section outside of Jenkins, Kentucky called Slick Rock, and it was a black section of consolidated coal number nine uh, uh, housed these people there, their, their black coal miners. They were there at 11.30 on a Sunday night, he and two friends, where uh, Leonard Woods, according to their account, asked for a ride, and when the ride was denied, pulled a gun and shot Herschel Deaton. Um, he fled, they caught him, they put him in the jail, they buried Herschel Deaton two days later, and then a caravan of 27 cars crossed Coburn, Virginia, into Whitesburg, Kentucky, which is a distance of maybe 30 miles. They just constructed a highway across the mountain and 10 days before they had political dignitaries dedicate the highway connecting the two states. And they had a platform there complete with you know the World Series bunting on the side. And uh, that was still there. They busted Leonard Woods out. A crowd according to accounts of the 27 cars from Coburn met people from Fleming, Kentucky which was near Slick Rock, and a crowd of 500 newspapers said at 3 o'clock in the morning took him back to Consolidated Coal Number 9 where the coal authority said, no, don't, 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 do, don't do that here. You know, it's just rile people up. Take them up on the mountain. And so they did. They took them up on the mountain and tied a noose around, and they shot him. Uh, multiple times, they even severed the rope. And then, I have a picture there, I don't know if you can find it, of the charred body they poured gasoline on. 
Leonard Wood's body and uh, burned him. The next day, the uh, Mountain Eagle in Whitesburg, Kentucky, and the Cofield Progress and the Crawford Weekly, there are three papers we have accounts that 1,500 people came and viewed the body. We interviewed a woman uh, who recalls her daddy saying he was in the fifth grade and they took a field trip up on the mountain to view that. Again, public spectacle to intimidate and to enforce Jim Crow. And Tina, you have found research much closer to home here in Bristol right. about a lynching here. Could you tell us about that? Sure. In 2018, it was the opening for the Lynching Memorial Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. So I was on what I call a, a pilgrimage. So I wanted to go to Montgomery, wanted to go to Selma. But in the, the Lynching Memorial Museum, as we were walking through the museum, I saw a monument. And it was where I live, and I had never heard anything about a lynching. It was Robert Clark, uh, June 1891. So whenever I returned to Bristol, I was just really curious to see who else knew anything about the lynching. So, you know, reached out to several people, um, and then I did my own research, and then I found this one article in the Roanoke Times which really kind of outlined what happened. Um, and then as I began to do more research, there were other sources. So there was a lynching that occurred here in Bristol, June uh, 1891. Uh, the gentleman's name was Robert Clark. Um, he was accused of assaulting um, a white woman uh, here in town. He was in the Bristol, Virginia jail a mob came in with an ax and busted him out of the jail, drug him to um, a location where he was lynched. Um, there were some couple of thousand people. I'm like, that's just amazing to me that you know, two to 3,000 people were actually present for that lynching. So I never saw a picture or, or anything other than the sources that I identified and then somebody um, found out that I was doing some research around Robert Clark and they sent me a picture from the archives at Cornell University of an actual postcard that was, um, it was a picture on a postcard that somebody had taken and it was of Robert Clark. So, and as I did additional research and started talking to people, it's like, did you know anything about this, you know? Um, then they said, Tina, I think there might be, you know, some family members of Robert Clark that still live in Bristol. So there is a Clark family here in Bristol who have been told this story from generations to generations. They don't know the exact connection that they have with Mr. Clark, um, but they do know that this is a story that they've heard in their family, and it's been told uh, for many years. So um, I've been... Um, I guess Preston and I probably met a couple of years ago and I knew that he was doing the work in Wise County. I had a desire to do something similar um, in Bristol, a community remembrance project. So we are currently pulling together a coalition of folks and we're gonna have our first meeting on February the 22nd and our desire is to memorialize uh, Robert Clark, but also, um, the Equal Justice Initiative, it's not enough just to you know, do a few actions. They want to see that as a community that you're educating yourself about lynching, that you're learning um, as a community. So they're wanting to see community involvement. Um, I wanted to uh, talk a little bit, so I have my notes. It was the Super Bowl last night, so I was up late. <laughs> so this is why it's important to me, and I think that is what people need to hear is, you know, I think about, you know, what I was taught in history. So, of course, I heard about the Emancipation uh, Proclamation and, and the freeing of slaves and the 13th Amendment. But what I didn't hear about was the racial terror that followed um, due to that resistance to change the social hierarchy that had been in place for 250 years. So that's a piece of history that we don't necessarily hear about. 
Uh, we don't hear about black codes. We don't hear about convict leasing. We hear a bit about Jim Crow, but we're talking about, you know, 1865 to, I say 1964, but Dr. King was assassinated in, what, 1968? So, I mean, this went on for years, and that's a piece of history um, that don't, we really don't talk about. We don't talk about that resistance to change the social hierarchy that was in place. So lynching was just a way of reminding black folks to stay in their place. So if you, you know, talk to, you know, if a man talked to a white woman, you stepped off the sidewalk, just anything to put you in your place and to inflict terror on the community. Um, with um, Robert Clark, it's important because he didn't receive justice. Now, when you look at the articles, you'll see all kinds of stuff about him. You know, he was a desperado, he was this, he was that. Uh, we don't know what Robert Clark was, but we know that he was somebody's child, he was somebody's family member, and we know that he didn't receive justice. So that's really what um, drives me and why I feel it is important and why EJI feels it's important. This is a, just a situation of racial terror, he didn't receive justice. And as a community, what can we learn from that? Because history um, certainly shapes us and you know, who we are. So what can we learn from that? So there was a, a quote that I absolutely love whenever I visited um, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery. And it says, history, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. So how can we heal as a country and as a community unless we're willing to face you know, what happened in the past? Let me say one thing uh, regarding what Tina said, this is more than just putting markers up. It's, it is to have, just like we're having today, conversations. Uh, UVA Wise uh, got a grant from Charlottesville and conducted a one-day workshop for teachers, history teachers, and English teachers in the community. And we, speakers were brought in, discussions were had, how to teach difficult things such as lynching. But the General Assembly of Virginia in February of 2019 passed re Joint Resolution 655, 198 to zero. It's not Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, and in that, it was an acknowledgement of the lynching and, and all of those whereas re the rec <clears throat> recognition that the legacy of slavery has not yet been eradicated in Virginia. Powerful words. And calling on communities to establish community remembrance project groups with Equal Justice Initiative to have necessary conversations and erect markers at the lynching spots. That piece, by the way, is what really propelled us to get res resolutions from town governments, school boards, historical societies, et cetera. I, I will, can I have to say one more thing? So I, I work for an organization called Bristol's <clears throat> Promise and we're really kind of, we look at trauma and the impact that trauma has on shaping outcomes for people. So whenever you think about lynching, and, and there's some studies that are being conducted around epigenetics and how that history lives inside of us. So um, I, I think that, you know, we see some of the outcomes that we see today are a result of what's been passed down from generation to generation through generational trauma. And this is an example of generational trauma. I think about some of the things that I do, and then as I learn about what happened in history, it's like, oh, okay, I understand why I do that. Um, we did something on the, the Green Book uh, a few weeks ago, and I never understood why whenever my family went on vacation that we always packed all of our food, uh, and we never stopped. Well, it's because we couldn't stop because there were places that weren't safe. So I'm like, why can't we, mom, dad, why can't we stop at this restaurant? And you know, I'm tired of the picnic lunch, but we did the picnic lunch for a reason. So that's that generational trauma that is passed down. And you know, I don't care if you're white or if you're black, you know, we all have some, I mean, we're all impacted by what's happened in our history. I look at the pictures 
of the lynchings and you see the, the children and the families gathered as if it's a big carnival. Now you know that that has an impact on those families who actually witnessed that. So I know that you had uh, some pushback trying to, to make this memory public. And what do you say to that when people want to say, well, let's just move on. We don't want to remember any of these horrible things. Uh, what, how do you answer that? Yeah, Preston and I have had conversations. So Preston, do you want to take it? Well, my answer to that is that we have treated this, treated racism. And we recognize it's something bad. It happened, but it happened a long time ago. And we've placed a bandage over that wound. And while that is done, is the wound is festered. We've seen it really in the pushback the last two, three years since George Floyd and the backlash from that. What we need to do is take the bandage off. We need to dig out that wound. And that ain't easy. That ain't easy. And it's painful. But that's really the only way to cure the wound that is embedded, as Tina says, in our history. You know, I think about my, my father a couple of years ago. He had a stroke. And my dad bi wasn't big on exercise or any of those things, but in order to recover from that stroke, he had to go through occupational therapy. He had to go through physical therapy because he wanted to be mobile again. He wanted to be able to move around. So I kind of look at this as Preston described. You know, physical therapy is not fun for anybody. Nobody wants to have to go through that, and it is painful. But in order for us to heal as a community and a country, we have to rip that Band-Aid, and we have to go to physical therapy. You know, if it's three times a week or whatever it is, we have to do whatever it takes. And I think it's important. I think it will make us better as a country, as a community. And, you know, I, I understand that, there, that, that people may feel shameful. This is not the way that I want to see my country, but it's all of our history. So we all need to face it together. I'm curious, in doing the work that you've been doing, um, how has faith been an element of that, uh, of that effort for you? In what ways is that, has your Christian faith informed the effort to peel back the, the, the Band-Aid and dig out the wound? For me, I'm, I'm drawn back to, in our faith tradition, our baptismal covenant, when we're called to respect the dignity of every human being. Um, and of course, the words from the prophet Micah about love and mercy, practice justice, and walking humbly with God. Uh, those are two things that just prop up about my faith that do uh, gives me the energy and the will and the want, the desire uh, to do this, this, this kind of work. And I would agree with um, Preston. And I think about the fact that God didn't create a social hierarchy. And we are all his creation. Um, he didn't create one above the other. So to me, it's really, this is doing the work. This is ministry for me. And sometimes I'm like, okay, Lord, why can't you give me something fun to do? You know, something that, you know, people will be happy about and that, you know, they'll just welcome with open arms. But I feel like for me, it's just a, a call that God has on my life at this point and it's ministry. And are there points that you have encountered along the way? We've talked about things being difficult, but are there points of hope in the work you've done? Where do you, do you see things that are moments of healing and reconciliation? Can you give us some of those along the way? I think the, very, the first big aha moment for me that, that maybe things are, are, are getting through is that um, I grew up, I, I didn't grow up, I, I raised a family in the little community of Pound, which was a completely white community in high school. My kids graduated from high school there. And the, the Leonard Woods lynching, which took place in the Pound community on the border of Kentucky and Virginia with the last documented lynching, which, by the way, led to Virginia passing the first anti-lynching law in America, 
I would get some publicity from that. But, and I went to talk to the Pound Historical Society. And I'm 70 years old, and I went to talk to them. I was a youngster there, okay? <laughs> And most of them were these little old white ladies, and, and I gave the, gave the talk. And afterwards, the president of that says, you know, I've heard of this all my life, but we need to do something. That marker was the, 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 propelled by the, those little old white ladies in Pound, Virginia, put up the money to put up that sign. And when we had that uh, video, which you can see on Black and Appalachia, it was a terrible day. It was sleeting. The wind was howling. I said, ain't nobody coming to this. <laughs> WCYB, they were there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, these people started coming in. I went, wow, we got 50, 60 people. And people from coming across the border. You saw the Reverend Steve Peak on, on the video. He was there. They came. That gave me hope from that little community, those little old white ladies. So um, I think the fact that we're here today gives me hope whenever I look out and I see, you know, all of you who showed up to, to hear this topic, that gives me hope. Um, for the coalition for the Bristol Community Remembrance <coughs> Project, I mean, I was like nervous. I'm like, nobody's gonna sign up for this. You know, I, I'm like, nobody wants to talk about this. We have a full coalition that represents um, city government. It represents education. Can I say Martin is a part of the, Dr. Daughter White <laughs> is part of the coalition. So that gives me hope that, you know, people recognize that this is something that we need to do and they want to be a part of it. So I guess if I think of the most current piece of hope is the fact that we have a full coalition and we have people who've raised their hand and said we want to be a part of this. That's right. Julia, we, we have a couple of minutes left. I wonder if you have kind of a final word for us on how we can be um, advocates and participants uh, this month, uh, but not just this month, in trying to recover this memory and trying to use that as a source of healing and hope. <laughs> wow. I think this is the type of thing, uh, this many folks coming, and I don't know, I can, I'm sure you got school credit for it, you wouldn't hear, but, but thanks anyhow, uh, and the administration for allowing that. Talk about, talk about these things. When you hear some of the pushback, say, well, this is why this is important. Uh, I was kind of brought in on the tail end with uh, Tina in the Bristol Historical Society about Charles Spurgeon Johnson and the marker that's down at the Cumberland Park. Uh, incredibly important, the first African-American marker uh, in the city of Bristol. And that was a glorious celebration. And that was, I think, a little easier sale than what we're doing here. So it really needs to be the conversations and, and telling why this is important. Tell the story about ripping the bandage off and taking physical therapy and the pain and all of that. Spread the word. When we get newspaper coverage, when we get, when we get TV coverage, this all is the conversation. And that's what it's about, conversation, to be in relationship, to tell all of our history. I agree with uh, Preston, so absolutely. I would encourage you to go to the Equal Justice Initiative website and read um, about the Equal Justice Initiative. There's a, a report called um, Racial Lynchings in America, um, real detailed report. So I would say get educated about um, the effort and truly, this is a community project. I don't want it to be about me or about Preston. It's like, as a community, what do you wanna do? What do you think that you could do to kind of further the conversation uh, to educate people um, within your sphere of influence? So I would say get educated, go to the Equal Justice Initiative site. Mm -hmm. Think about what is it that you want to do to further this conversation and to bring healing into the community. 
Great. Well, thank you so much to Preston and Tina. Please join me in thanking both of our panelists today. Dismissed.